miss. So if you ever miss a session, know that it'll be sent to you and you can always catch up. First of all, I'm going to do a really quick, this is why we're doing it kind of introduction because I know we want to get cooking and we got some anxious kids in the kitchen ready to chop an onion and cry or that <laughs> I think you're anxious and getting ready to do. But Shelly, you guys probably all know Shelly. Shelly's on here and Shelly and I are going to tag team teaching. So I'm teaching this week. Shelly's going to kind of monitor the chat and answer questions if you have questions. And then next week, Shelly's going to teach and I'm going to monitor the chat and we're going to tag team it as we go. All of you should have got a great looking little cookbook called Eat Together, Cook Together. Might not find my cover page. Mine might look a little different because I got an older version that I got about a year ago. And mine's spiral and yours is nice hardback. So you, everyone should have got a cookbook. And what we're going to do is do four of the recipes in there, but we're going to encourage you to do more of them throughout the weeks and as you go. Yeah, yours is really nicer than mine because mine's still flimsy. But tonight we're going to do the chicken and dumpling soup and hopefully that's a recipe that you might like. And the reason why we're kind of doing these sessions is because the more you get your kids involved in the kitchen, helping you out in the kitchen, um, the better, the more variety of food they might try and eat. And then it also gets them to learn the love of cooking and cooking at home and helps us all become a little more healthier and helps us bond a little more as a family. So that's our goal and our mission. With, <laughs> and um, we're going to, um, Shelly's going to keep up with trying to like, if you have a question, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask a question. But for the most part, we'll try to keep everybody muted. And I'm going to put me in the spotlight because, you know, I like to be in the spotlight. And hopefully that makes me nice and large so you can see me mainly on the screen instead of all the little squares. Everybody got that? Can everybody see that? First thing that you always do when you're doing a recipe, and hopefully you have done this. If you haven't done this, you're going to need to do this before each class coming up because it'll help our process go along. You have the ingredients listed. So you should be prepared. You know, that's somebody's motto, isn't it, Shelly? Or is that the Boy Scout motto? Boy Scout so see all my stuff over here? I have all my ingredients that I have for my recipe. I have my onion, I have my carrots, I have my celery, I have my flour, an egg, I have my kale. So everything that's listed, I got my baking powder. So if you can have all your ingredients always out and ready before you prepare a recipe, that's very helpful for a couple reasons. One, if you get halfway through the recipe and you're missing an ingredient, you might not be able to finish the product the way it's supposed to be finished. So you want to try to make sure you have everything that you need. And sometimes in cooking, you can substitute different things. You had prep work to do before this one. So hopefully your chicken looks like this already, cooked and shredded. Now I'll tell you, Ken is a lazy cook. Those of you who've cooked with me on some of these before, Ken I bought a rotisserie chicken from Kroger's when I was there shopping the other day and then I shredded it. You could also have bought it like this. Now, anytime you buy things that are prepared, it's a little more costly. And if you're on a budget, I believe back in the back of your book on page 73, tells you how to roast your own chicken. So you could have roasted your own chicken for this and then shredded it if you want it to be a little more um, adventurous than myself. But today, you should have that already done. Should already be shredded. So we're gonna start this recipe and we're gonna work through it together. You might've pre-prepped some other things, but we will tell you what needs to be pre-prepped as we go along. So number one, First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this handy dandy onion and we're gonna cut it. Now, parents, you know the kids in your kitchen, you'll know if they can handle a sharp knife. You'll know if you have other gadgets in your kitchen that might help them with this, but there'll be some things they'll be able to help you with and some things they will not be able to help you with. The one thing I wanna tell you about an onion, this part right here is called the stem. This part right here is called the root, or sometimes I call it the butt of the onion. So this is the butt of the onion. Okay, that's important when we do the next step. Everything cuts better when it's flat. So if you're gonna move you down. And another thing you wanna make sure you do if you're using a chef knife, right? 
You're gonna make sure you're teaching your kids how to hold a knife correctly if they're the ones that are gonna cut. A lot of adults don't even know how to hold a knife correctly. So if you're using a chef knife, very similar to this, you wanna grip it as close to the blade as you can. I don't wanna see anybody doing this. So Shelly, as you're watching them cut, if you see anybody doing this, call them out. Because sometimes things are sharp up here. This doesn't give you good stability on your knife. And it's a habit that a lot of us have formed very young. So you're gripping it tight. You're gripping it as close to the blade as possible. You can put a thumb on it. I can't even get to there to show you. You can put a thumb on it, but just so you're getting a firm grip. The next thing we're gonna do to our onion so we can get this recipe started is we're just gonna cut the onion in half from root to stem. So however you wanna do it, you're going always down, you're cutting that onion in half. It still has the peel and everything on it. You're gonna end up with nice two halves of onions. Once you get that part done from the stem down, you're gonna peel off that extra skin, the stuff that you don't want when you cut up and dice your onion, okay? So you're just gonna kind of peel it back, however you can get it to peel for you. you don't like your hands to smell as onions, you can use a glove. But you're gonna peel off at least that top layer of all that rough skin. But you're leaving that root or tail on. If you don't like a lot of onions, you can only do half an onion. If you like onions, get both of them ready to go so you can cut up both of them. So I'm gonna peel off both because I like onions. I'll leave some of the other things out as I go. And then the next thing you're gonna do, and if you're teaching your kids to cook, well, never mind. I'm gonna cut off the stem first. So you're gonna take a little slice, cut off that stem once you peeled it, not the root, just that little part of the stem. When you are cutting, one, you're holding your knife nice and firm. Two, you're always curling your fingers back. And this cut, I'm gonna kind of put the root away from me and hold it on the side. And what I want to do is I want to put the tip of my knife in as close to the root as I can get, angle it down and cut a wedge, but I don't want to cut all the way through. So I'm putting my root as close to the edge as pop, my knife as close to the edge as possible and cutting down in a wedge. So you can cut straight down if that's easier for you. Sometimes it'll come apart, but you're trying to keep it together with the root. If you're cutting your onion to go through this process with me, you can bridge over it and cut between your thumb and your pointer finger if that's easier, but no matter what, you're keeping your fingers away from the blade. So once you're done, you should have all these nice little wedges. How many people do we have crying so far? Yeah. <laughs> Show of hands. I will tell you one thing. If you leave the root on the onion, it helps with the crying. Okay? okay. That's one thing. And another thing you can do with help with the crying is keep your onions cold. Okay? That helps as well. Once you get that much done, you're going to cut cup your fingers again, and you're just going to go through, and you're going to dice it. And you're rocking your knife from the tip to the back with a good firm grip and you're just dicing it. If it's not as small as you want, go back and rock your knife a little more and chop it up a little more. And you're gonna do that to both halves, unless you don't like a lot of onions. I'm just gonna keep on working and Shelly's gonna, you are gonna tell me to slow down or speed up, but your goal is right now to be cutting both of your onions halves, unless you're deciding you're only putting one in there. It did call for a yellow onion. I used a white onion. I like a little sweeter onion. That's why I kind of went with the white, but you can go with whatever onion you want. We doing on our cutting, Shelly? We're doing good. I still see some people doing a little bit of chopping. Uh, some look like they have finished that. 
Um, so yeah, if anybody ends up having a question, if you need to type something in the chat box, I'm doing the best I can to keep up with that. You can use your little emojis and raise your hand. I can try to address you that way. There's multiple ways to try to interject if you have a question or a comment. So to get our onions out of the way, for those of you who have, I got a big stock pot. That's one other thing that you need to make sure you have all the right equipment that you need to cook with. So I have a big stock pot. So you need to get a big stock pot out if you do not already have it. And then you're going to need a bowl to mix your dumplings in. In this stock pot is where we're adding our olive oil. Now, I'm not, I don't like to measure. I don't like to clean. I like to make as few messy dishes as possible. So your recipe does call for I believe it says, maybe it doesn't say how much olive oil. It just says in the thing, in olive oil. Two tablespoons. Two tablespoons. All right. So I'm just going to like, you know, take my little olive oil. I think it looks like about two tablespoons and move forward. So I don't have to dirty up a tablespoon. Then I'm going to add my onions to this pot because I'm going to add everything else before I turn it on. I'm going to get my onions out of the way. And we're going to move on to our next ingredients. And I'll set my pot out of the way till we get the other ones done. Everybody doing OK right now? All right. In a large stock pot that we're sauteing our onions, our celery, and our carrots. So after we get our onions cut, we're moving on to our carrots. Now, remember Kenna said, and you can repeat this, and I'm not ashamed of it whatsoever. I am a super lazy cook. And the recipe says, peel your carrot. You can peel your carrot if you want. You can use any kind of vegetable peeler you might have, and you're just gonna like peel it down, okay? However, I can tell you, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the skin on a carrot. So what I prefer to do is make sure I've washed my carrots really well and leave the skins on. Saves me one step. You can do whichever you wish to do with your carrots. If you're afraid that skin, you might not like it, you've never done it before, go ahead and peel your carrot. If you wanna try it with the skin on, I promise you once it sautés and cooks with everything else, you're not even gonna know that skin's on that carrot because it's super thin. And a lot of times all of our nutrients are in the skin of things. So once you have your carrot peeled and or just cleaned really well, you're gonna cut a little bit off the tip and you're gonna cut off the end. So you're cutting four carrots. They recommend you never cut anything longer than the blade of your knife. So for the sake of cutting this easier, we're going to cut these carrots in half. I'm going to get the rest of mine ready and cut in half. It's just something that makes it easier to control when you're cutting if you're not cutting things larger than the blade of your knife. Sometimes if you can make a little flat edge to your carrot, it'll help with your cutting. So if you can cut off a little thing and make it flat so it lays flat, that helps sometimes as well. And then basically you're going to bridge over your carrot and you're going to kind of cut it in half. This one I forgot to cut in half. That's why I'm not doing as well. And then you're going to lay it flat again, and you're going to cut it in half again. And you're going to get these nice little strips. And I've got to practice what I preach. I forgot to cut that carrot in half. And you notice once I cut that carrot in half, it made it a lot easier for me to maneuver around it. So then I have these nice little strips of carrots. And then I'm going to chop them. Same way, you're gonna rock your chef knife back and forth and chop them into little pieces. Curl in your fingers while you're chopping, and keeping it going as you're going, okay? And you got four carrots to cut. Remember you're cutting them in half first so they're not as long. 
If you think it's not gonna roll around too much for you, you can cut it in half next. If you think it's gonna to roll too much around for whoever you're helping cut, and a lot of these first steps, if you have younger kids, they might just be handing you the carrots and helping you as you're preparing them. And when we get to measuring stuff a little bit later, they'll be more actively involved. You're cutting these carrots into little thing, strips, and then you're chopping them. But one thing you want to remember is cut them in half before you start that because when they're longer, they're harder to, to work with. Let's see. Uh, we have one comment that there's no sound. Monica, are you able to hear us again? Or is there anybody else that's having an issue with sound? Is Monica the only one? She said there's no sound. Can everybody else hear me or is it just Monica? I can hear you. Okay. Monica, I think it's on your end. All right, so we're cutting these carrots. Once we're done with the carrots, we're sticking them in the pot. And you notice the smaller you cut them, the even the least amount of skin that you see. Oh no, I can't hear them. Somebody else say they can't hear, was that still Monica? I think that's Monica, Let's see. Shelly, if Monica can't hear, tell right in the chat what I'm doing as we go along. If it's something that she can't visually see. I can do that. Watch their fingers, make sure nobody has a knife. You'll watch me sometimes and somebody will call me out on it. I'll go like this a lot because it's a habit I formed very young. It was a bad habit. I'm just kind of quartering them because my carrots were smaller. If yours were a little fatter, you might want to third them. And you're keeping those fingers curled, especially when you get to the edge. You're kind of using this knuckle as a guide as you go with your fingers curled. Your knife can almost rest on it as long as your fingers are curled really tight underneath there. Some of the other classes when we have a lot of chopping to do, if we if you watch this session and you know the, some of the knife safety things to concentrate on, we might have you do a little prep ahead on that as well. But we wanted to make sure we're covering all those basic kitchen skills that's really important for you and your child to have in the kitchen. Once your carrots are all cut, and if you're as slow as I am, you might be getting there. You're also then just adding them to your pot as well. You see right here, I have a wet paper towel under my cutting board. These cutting boards tend to slide. You dampen a wet paper towel and put it under your cutting board. It helps keep them from sliding while you're cutting. Okay, I'm gonna go on to celery and I know some of you are gonna still be cutting your carrot or you might be faster than me. You're gonna do the same with your celery. You should have cleaned it, made sure it's clean. I don't like celery, so I'm gonna put less celery in it than the recipe might call for, but you're gonna cut off the end a little bit. Depending on how you bought it, you might have to cut up a little bit of the top, but leaves are edible. So you can chop some of those in it as well, if you want. The center stalks always tend to be a little more tender. So I'm gonna pull some of these tender parts out because I don't like the stringy part of the celery, but that's Kenna. And with the celery, it's already kind of ribbed. So you're basically gonna turn it upright like a boat and you're gonna cut down the center of it. And then if that's too large and you want smaller pieces, 
you're going to bridge it again. Well, you're going to do the first thing I told you. Cut it in half because it's longer than the blade of your knife. So cut your pieces in half first and then boat it and cut it down the center. And mine, I think I'm just going to cut down the center. If you think some of those pieces are a little large or you have larger celery than myself, um, cut them a little smaller. But you're always bridging over it with your fingers and cutting between. And some of these smaller ones, I might not even have to do that with. And then you're just chopping it. We're almost done with all this fun chopping stuff. Putting it in your pot after you chop it. Says two stalks of celery. Put as much celery in it or as little amount of celery that you want. And if you really don't like celery, don't put it in at all. Just remember when you're cooking, you have more flexibility than when you're baking. If you're baking, you gotta stay pretty true to the recipe. If you're cooking, you make it your own recipe. So if there are things you don't like or don't like you, don't put them in it. Once you got your celery, it's going in your pot. So in your pot, once everybody's done, you should have carrots, celery, and onions. Then you're gonna turn your pot on to like a medium to high heat. It says medium to low, but I'd almost put it on to a medium high. And you know your stove better than I know your stove. That's one of the reasons why you're cooking in your own kitchen. So you get, you're familiar with it and your kids are familiar with it. But you're gonna put it on for about five minutes and start to get these vegetables tender. So if you are that far, turn on your stove, put your pot on it, which I have going over here now. And for about five minutes, you're gonna saute it. Depending on the pot you're using, you know, some pots you can't use metal on, some pots you can. Some of you maybe got this nice handy dandy tool in your bag. It's very good for stirring these vegetables in your pot. It is not metal, so it should not scratch your pot. So you can use this or you can use a wood, whatever works easiest for you. I kind of like my bamboo ones, but this I've used multiple times in my kitchen for multiple different things because you have a slotted edge on this side and a solid edge on this side and it would stir your vegetables in your pan just fine. Shelly, how we're doing? Are we, do we, I think we're, full yeah. How often are we on the stove? I think most people look like they are on the stove. All right, so we're just gonna let that go for a few minutes. I'll move some of my mess out of my way. So once we get these sauteing for about five minutes, our next step is to add our broth. And if you look at our broth in the recipe, it says two quarts of fat-free chicken broth. So, I'm gonna put me up some. Who knows how many cups are in a quart? I see some shrugs. Anybody have a clue? So a lot of times we can buy our chicken broth and nice little things like this. Right? Get a glare. And it's, I bought the low sodium one. And honestly, there's so much sodium in broth. You can buy the low sodium one and never know the difference. So, and it did call for low sodium. And if you look on the little side of it. There are four cups in a pint, cool. in a quart. Oh, yeah. Very good. Who said that? Could you tell Shelly? If you look on yeah, this little, very good. If you look on this little box, this is four cups worth of chicken broth. So in my head, when I was even at the store, I had to do quick math. When I knew I needed two quarts, I'm like, oh, I don't need one of these. How many did I need? If I needed two quarts and there's four cups in here, how many of these did I need for the recipe? 
Two. Two. I hope you bought two. Or maybe if you roasted your chicken yourself, you used all the bones and made your own chicken broth, which you could do. So get your chicken broth ready. And if you're in this, you don't have to measure. If you're not in this, and you're making it from a can or something that you made yourself, let me see if I can find my big glass measure down here. No. You're gonna need a liquid measurer like this to measure your broth in. But this already has it measured for us and it's four cups, so we know this is one quart. So if you bought it this way, you're good to go. Or you read and see how much you bought and know you need eight cups worth. And if I felt that filled this up to here, that's four cups, so I need to do that twice. So get your chicken broth ready because that's going in our pot next. Give them mine a quick stir because we're just starting to get them tender. And I can tell you right now, you're going to have a big pot of chicken and dumplings. So I hope you like chicken and dumplings. I'm watching my watch. Another important thing to have in a kitchen is a timer. So if we're supposed to saute them for five minutes, you want to make sure that you have a timer so you know. And if you start at yours about the same, sorry, I'm taking a few pictures because I never remember to. Um, if you start at yours about the same time I start at mine, we got just a few more minutes, not long. Emma mentioned that this is gonna make a lot of soup. And one of the little side notes in your book talks about the leftover. So even if you can't eat it all tonight, you can store this in your refrigerator and it's gonna taste even better the next day because like all soups, once they have time to really mesh those flavors together, they're always better the next day and even the day after that. So be sure you keep your leftovers and enjoy it for days to come or eat it all tonight if you've got enough people that are there to dine with you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and pour my chicken broth in. So if you're there, go ahead. Remember if you're having your younger kids help you with them to make sure you talk to them about the stove and make sure you talk to them about the pot being hot and you don't want them to touch it. If you have a pot that has handles on it, so I dump both of mine in. If you have a pot that has handles on it, make sure your handles are this way, not facing out, so you don't catch I, it as you go by. I believe we have a question. Okay. Let's see a hand raise. Um, are the chicken ball containers. containers recyclable? Yes, they are. Good question. And you can yes. ask the extension office. So if you're looking on their boxes, you're always looking for this little triangle. So the schools have recycling bins and so does the extension office. So if it is on there, and this is something new they just added to ours, cardboard boxes, apple juice little containers, all those are recyclable now. So good question. We are now, we had the broth in, what else are we adding? Who has the recipe? After we are adding go ahead the chicken the peppercorns the thyme and the bay leaves all right so to that pot and i'm leaving the mine on a medium high because you know i want to eat tonight sometime so i'm going to add my chicken how much chicken did it call for two cups worth of shredded but if you got more than two cups because that's what you ended up with with your chicken you're good with that too you know, you can, in my opinion, you can't have too much chicken. So very carefully add that to your pot. And remember if it was done ahead of time and you had it in your refrigerator, or if you've purchased the kind that went like this, anything cool's going in, it's gonna take it longer to heat back up. That's why I'm kind of leaving mine on medium high as well. So I got my chicken in. I do not have peppercorn, but you can just add pepper. So even if you don't have peppercorn, you can just add some ground pepper. 
So use whatever you want. I don't like the whole peppercorns. I don't like that. I don't want to have to scoop them out. I don't want to bite into it. So I'm just going to add a little pepper to mine. And you can do the same. Or you can use your peppercorns if that's what you have. And when I say a little, remember, you don't necessarily have to measure as precisely when you're cooking. So I'm just shaking a little on there. You won't have to add extra salt to this recipe because your chicken broth has a lot of salt in it. And then if you have bay leaves, you're plopping in two bay leaves and they're kind of big enough. You'll be able to pick them out when we're done because you're not really going to want to eat those. They're adding flavor. Hey, Kenna. Yes. Bay leaves. So I have the same container. I never have ever cooked with bay leaves. So how long will those last? And do you need to refrigerate them or leave them out room temperature? Uh, I will keep it's it's best if they're kept in the refrigerator okay. and they will keep depending on as long as you keep them dry. They'll keep for weeks, but you're right. By the time you get done, you ever use these again, you might never need them again. But they are kept best in the refrigerator. If you buy them in a tin, which you can buy this way some, they're usually in a darker container. You can't get light into them. So they're gonna tend to keep a little longer, but your more flavorful ones are gonna come in packages like this. So these, if they were in a container like this, would keep a very long time. Those in your refrigerator will, as long as you keep them dry, will keep for, you'll kind of tell. It's kind of like when you open it up, you'll know if it feels moist or wet or a little slimy, you're not gonna wanna use it then. They need to be dry. And these tend to be a drier herb, even though it's fresh in here. So they're gonna keep a little longer. It will keep longer than your thyme if you bought your thyme fresh. And if you're using dry thyme, it tells you to use two teaspoons. If you're using fresh, you use more. And if you're using thyme, you're not, you could put it in all like this and then pull it out if you want, or you're gonna go over your pot and kind of scrape the leaves off and try to get them into it. So it depends on how you want the flavor. You're not really gonna to want to eat the stem. However, you can, but you're just gonna add your thyme. I tend to, when I'm using thyme, I don't like a whole lot of thyme, so I'm not gonna put a lot in it. It's not an herb that Kenna is a huge fan of, but it does add some really good, um, rich, more kind of savory, I guess, more than rich flavoring to some of the things you're doing. So if you're adding dry, it's not going to be as strong as you're adding for as if you're adding fresh, but you always have to add more fresh than you do of dry. So I'm just going to put a little time in mine, and then it's all in there simmering. And did anybody set their timer to know how long it's supposed to be simmering? Nope. What's our recipe say? Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. So we're going to set a timer and it's already been going for a little bit. So it might not need to go quite the whole 20 minutes. However, a lot of the stuff that we might've put in might be a little colder. And why that is simmering, we're going to go on to our next step in the recipe. It also said something else in the recipe. In this pot, what were we supposed to do? If you're reading, that step in the recipe when we're putting it on to simmer or putting it on for a few minutes, is it supposed to be covered or uncovered? Partially covered. Partially covered. What does that mean? It means that it should be covered about halfway or so. Right. So if you're putting a lid on it, you're kind of like not sealing it on, you're venting it some. Can you kind of see that, how I did that on my pot? I didn't close it tight. I kind of angled it. One thing you have to watch, if you angle a pot lid like this, it could get moisture and it could drip down. But if you're partially covering it, this is what it's talking about. You're just not covering it tightly, you're partially covering it. So make sure if you have a cover for your pot, put that on there. If you do not, get a piece of foil, and this is for the parents, not for the child, and cover up your pot leaving a crack on one side. 
And then the parent is also gonna take that foil off if we take the foil off. So if you don't have a stock pot that has a lid, that's another way you can partially cover it. Okay, we got this partially covered. We got it hanging out on the stove. Everybody with me? Everybody give me a thumbs up if we're with me. Everybody good? Next, we're gonna make the best part of the recipe. Find yourself a bowl, right? In your bowl, what are we gonna make? And we're going to make dumplings. We're gonna make dumplings. All right, what is a dumpling? What's a dumpling? A Flour and dough. It's like a dough, it's like a biscuit. It's something we're gonna plop in here. It's the part that makes the chicken and dumplings good most of the time, right? And our dumplings call for our flour, our baking powder, our milk, and our eggs. So we're gonna start out with measuring our wet ingredients into a bowl because you always start with your wet ingredients, not your dry ingredients. So the very first thing I'm gonna put in my bowl is my egg. And if you have a little whisk, these are what makes the best for whisking your egg. The reason why if you have an egg in the recipe and then you're gonna mix your dry ingredients to it is because you want to make sure this is beaten together and um, I don't know the right word, mixed together well before you start adding everything else or you might just have clumps not mixed as good. I got a pretty egg came from my brother's chickens, I think. It kind of looks dirty, but it's really not. It's really speckly, kind of pretty. One thing you don't want to do when you're cracking your egg, don't use the side of your bowl. The germs or the bacteria on your egg is going to be more on your shell. So you're going to be very careful. You're going to crack it lightly on a countertop. And then you're going to gently put it in your bowl. And hopefully you don't get any shells in there. If you would happen to get a shell in there, this almost acts like a magnet. So if you would get a little shell, use your egg shell to scoop it up if you can get it to the side with, in a sense, if you can. If not, don't worry about it. That's something somebody told me once. And then you're gonna whip it. You're gonna mix that egg all together. And that egg is part of our wet ingredients. The next wet ingredients is what? we're doing in this mixture. We have two wet and two dry. I'm giving you a hint. Milk. Milk. How much milk are we putting in it? Three quarters of a cup. Three quarters of a cup. So you need a liquid measure, which means it's a measure that has a spout on it. And then this one has it listed up to on the side. Or if you have a glass one, you're gonna put it on the counter and you're gonna watch it on the side. Oops, I went too high as well. So we're gonna measure out three quarters of a cup. We're gonna add it to our egg and we're gonna mix it together. It calls for fat, no, it calls for low fat milk. You can use any kind of milk, 2%. You're just, the low fat is gonna save you on the fat. Just trying to make it a little healthier. Then we got two wet ingredients. What are the two wet ingredients? Or dry, I mean, not wet. We just did those. Baking powder and flour. Okay, how much baking powder are we using? We are using two teaspoons two your teaspoons so find your things that look like tablespoons teaspoons half a teaspoons quarter teaspoons so find some little gadget looks similar to this or whatever you might be using you might have one shaped more like this but find your one that's a teaspoon it's usually the one directly on top of the tablespoon or under the tablespoon so it usually goes tablespoon teaspoon. And we're using two. 
Most of the time our baking powder has a little metal part on the side of it to where as you do it, you can fill it up, scrape it off and make it level. So you're putting two in. And this is where some of those younger kids can really give a hand and help. You have them help measure. You can help them dump that in the bowl. And you're putting two in, right? That's what my recipe reader told me. Ooh. If your pot starts to boil, you can turn it down a little. I can see mine boiling some, just a little, not a lot. Okay, you got your two, table, two teaspoons of baking powder. Then we're adding two cups of flour. I have a cup measurer. One thing that I learned from the chef when we're baking, and this is more on the line of baking, is to scoop. And I'm gonna use this bowl to kind of get my extra out. So what you're gonna want to do is take something smaller and lightly put it in your cup, okay? And scoop it out instead of packing it in while you're doing it. This isn't as important as if you're baking something different, but if you watch our cooking through the calendar, you're gonna get a good visual on why this is important. And you kind of spread it out, find something flat, scrape off the excess, make sure all the things are in, put one in. Go ahead and measure out two and put both in at the same time. Yeah, this looks great. I'm headed over for dinner, okay? Okay. <laughs> I think you're, oh yeah, Shelly's not cooking. She's cooking next week, sorry. That's all right. I'm sending Michael out for some pizza. I don't have any food here. It's what you're making or Doritos and yours looks better right now, so. <laughs> so I'm making that, leveling it off, dumping it in my bowl. One thing really important when you're making the dumplings and the recipe tells us on the side, this is really good. You can have your kids help you stir it up and make it, but you don't want to do what? Over stir it. Because if you over stir it, it won't rise. So basically what you're stirring and doing is trying to get all that flour wet. And it's going to be a really wet dough. So I don't care what the recipe tells you. You can be more fancier than Kenna and you might like messes. But it gives us an option of dropping it in by spoonfuls or rolling it out. This is a really wet dough, okay? It'd be really hard to roll out. We'd have to have extra flour down and I just... Yeah, you know, I already told you too many different times. And then you'll be telling everybody, Kenna's a lazy cook. I don't like to do dishes. I don't like more dishes than I need. And I sure don't like a mess all over my counter. So I'm not rolling mine out. If you wanna get more fancy, it does say, you can put a little flour down and you can roll it out and make little strips and make it look a little fancier. But I'm just gonna put mine in by spoon in just a few minutes. So now we got this all ready to go. And you should have your pot, and if your pot's doing like my pot's doing, it's kind of boiling. Is anybody else's pot boiling? So it's not really simmering if it's boiling, so I'm going to turn it down just a tad more. but it's mixing all those flavors together. How's everybody's dumplings look? Look pretty good, cool. yeah. Good job, Becky. Yeah. You're gonna want them to be able to flop in there. How many have made chicken and dumplings before? Yes, no? I always and use the canned biscuits. So <laughs> I've, I've never made them oh. by scratch. So yep. you're even more lazy than Kenneth. Yeah, Becky, I'm, 100%. Right. I'm right there. That's my mom. I would use the canned biscuits too. 
but we're teaching you how to do them in a different way, I guess. So I'm gonna get two spoons out. So when question. I, yes. Anna, if the dough is seems extra dry, is it okay to add some milk? You can add a little milk. Um, honestly, mine I think is too wet, so I added a little more flour. But that was me. Okay. Mm, somebody looks like they're licking and she's frozen. <laughs> I will tell you, I had whole wheat flour out as well. If you were gonna try to make it a little healthier and wanted to substitute. I would mix half and half. I wouldn't go totally whole wheat. But that's an option as well. So if you think of people saying they usually use biscuit dough for their dump for their dumplings in it, like just a canned biscuit dough, think of the consistency of a biscuit and try to get your batter about that consistency. And according to my handy nandy timer, we have about seven yeah. more minutes. Anybody else has a timer about the same? And honestly, if you've been boiling a little while and everything, we might go about a few minutes early. Maybe a pot holder over because I want to show you as I'm dropping them in. So basically our recipe says next, you're going to drop spoons full of dough into your simmering soup. Then you're covering it, not half covering it. You're covering it and allowing the dumplings to cook. So you're wanting the dough to be cooked. It'll be a wet dough, but you want it to be cooked and they will rise to the top when they're cooked. I'm telling you, it's smelling good. I'm gonna move my pot over, hopefully, so you have a better visual of what I'm gonna be doing. You can move your pot over if it makes it easier because this is when it can be a little fun for the kids. Make sure you make sure you let them know this is extremely hot if they touch it. I don't want anybody burnt in the kitchen. But and then also know that they should be able to take a spoon and a second spoon and you're just gonna drop little drops into the soup. Big, small, smaller the better, they'll get done quicker. And you're just dropping them in. You're gonna use up that whole bowl. They don't have to be pretty. If you rolled them out, you'd have a much prettier dumpling. Kenna, you said to start dropping the dumplings when your water's, when your um, pot's boiling? Well, it was said, it's supposed to be simmering. It was supposed to be 20 minutes in. So we're about okay. 30 minutes in. Mine boiled a little bit, which it really was supposed to be like simmering. So okay. About okay. ready. And if you can do it while it's still on the stove, it's gonna be better for the cooking process. I just wanted to move it over here, like while it's still on the burner, so people could see what I'm doing. And knowing that I'm really not doing pretty, I'm just dropping. And just keep dropping. You got more hands, you got help dropping. There's a lot of dough in here to keep dropping. We have a lot of dumplings. Everybody's quiet or I'm quiet because I'm just dumping. Tending to get bigger at the end, that might not be good.
once you have that all in, you're putting your pot back on. Simmering type heat, so medium to low. Putting your lid on. It says cover. And I know it says they're going to float when they're done, but mine seem like they're already floating. But still, you're going to cover them. One tip that's provided in your recipe book says that if you'd rather not make the dumplings, you can just add egg noodles and you'd wanna cook those about eight minutes prior to serving. So that's another option, but we're excited for the dumplings in this particular recipe for tonight for sure. Yeah, if you don't like a really doughy kind of soup slash stew almost, um, noodles is a good option as well. So I'm gonna wait a few minutes before we move on to kale. This also says 20 minutes. So once you have yours on and everybody has all their dumplings in, I want you to reset a timer somewhere in your house or in your kitchen or on your stove or on your microwave for 20 minutes. I'm gonna wait till everybody has all their dumplings ready before we move on. <laughs> this soup should be making close to 10 servings and a serving size is measured by two cups and each serving is estimated to have about 200 calories. And of course it's got 4.5 grams of fat. There's a little bit of saturated fat in there and some cholesterol and sodium, um, but we don't, like Kenna mentioned, don't, don't add any extra salt. Just enjoy what comes in your chicken broth for that. And then we've got some carbohydrates, which are gonna come mostly from your dumplings. And that could change if you either leave that out or added the egg noodles, that might look a little different. Um, we've got some fiber in here, a little bit of sugar, and 15 grams of protein. There you go. You actually, you could cut down on some of those calories if you didn't want to put the dumplings in it, but then you're letting the good stuff out. So also with this recipe, um, because of the, what the ingredients are that are in it, um, you could have, um, if you say you're doing like Becky did and you decided not to make your own dumplings and use biscuits, you could almost cut the whole recipe in half or make it all, take half out, freeze it, and then use some of your biscuit dough for you know, meal tonight and then you have another meal later on. There's nothing in this that you cannot freeze. So even the dumplings you can freeze, I just tend to think that if you could heat it back up and add your dumplings to it later, it might be a little better quality wise. So I'm kind of excited. Somebody said, if my, if my drought is dry, if my dough is dry, I gotcha. We already answered that. Sorry, Hannah. I think we already answered that. Add a little milk. You're good. Everybody done with their dumplings? Let me see how my faces are. Yeah, I think so. Looks like everybody's pretty We're gonna lovely. move on to, you know, this most exciting part in the whole recipe that probably nobody has ever put in chicken and dumplings ever before. How many of you put kale and chicken and dumplings before? Or a chicken and dumplings? Don't put your finger down. Don't you like act like you're not gonna like it. It says you can use any kind of greens. Now, I purchased my, I purchased baby kale. Who purchased different kale? Show me what kind of kale you purchased. If you have a bag or what you have in front of you that you purchased kale wise. 
Or did you decide, I don't want kale and decided to leave it out there, you know? We, we got ours from the garden. My dad grows it in his front yard. Oh, there you go. Very good. I call her. So I can tell you one thing about kale. People think kale is bitter. People think they don't like kale. Um, kale is very good for us. But one thing you can do with kale to help with some of the bitterness, and I think maybe it was in one of our cooking through the calendar thing is, is massage it. So if you got kale sitting in a bowl, just kind of like if you know you want somebody to rub your back and make your back feel good or rub your feet, just make believe these are your feet and you're gonna massage it the same way that you'd want somebody massaging your feet or your back or your hands, whatever you like to get massaged. And everybody likes a massage. So by massaging our kale a little bit, it will take some of the bitterness out of it. So I've got it pretty much massaged. Mine are smaller than some of yours might be. You could use spinach. You can use any kind of greens that you might be growing. Bethany, it's, it's being recorded, so I will send the recording out as well. I did, and we did not roll out our dumplings. We dropped them by spoonful. Okay, I've got my, my kale nicely massaged. I'm gonna take it by a little bit onto the counter. This would be really fun for you, the kids to do that are younger, helping you in the kitchen, let them get their hands on that kale and squeeze it, okay? And then I'm just gonna take my knife and I'm gonna give it some fine chops. You can pull it apart if you don't wanna chop it, but you're just gonna make it smaller pieces because you don't wanna get a big piece of kale in your mouth maybe while you're eating it. And I'm just gonna keep chopping it some. Cause this is one of the last things, if you watched me, I did this. Good thing nobody was watching. Hopefully everybody's massaging their own kale and not keeping up with what I'm doing wrong. So the reason why we massage it, and somebody had said they never heard of it before, it takes a little bit of that bitterness out of it by doing it that way. How does Kenna know that? Because Kenna watches cooking shows. Do you guys watch cooking shows? I love to watch cooking shows. And I also have been told that before when we were using it in kale in another recipe. All right, I'm using all of mine. Says how much should we use? Says about two cups. As far as I'm concerned, the more green, the healthier and the better. So you should have it all nicely chopped in kind of smaller pieces. They do make kid-friendly knives. It would be good for um, chopping this kale or some of those softer vegetables. Um, might be something you want to invest in if you have younger ones helping you. They tend to be plastic. I don't know if I have one in here or not that I can visual. Oh, yeah. They're more like this. So they're plastic and they're not really gonna cut them, but it would give them that opportunity to use a knife and learn to hold it the same way. So these are a good kitchen knife option for some of your younger kids that you might wanna look into purchasing. So even after I massaged it and put it back in my container, it's about a quarter of what was in there before. And so now, you know, we've got our kale cut, chopped. It's just gonna go in our pot towards the end. We still got about 10 minutes left before we add this. So what could your little ones help you do in the kitchen now while we're waiting on everything to cook? What are some things that you guys could help in the kitchen with? Clean up. Clean up. 
Do the dishes. That's one thing you could be doing while we're waiting. What's another thing? Set the table. Set the table. Who knows how to set a table? I'm gonna show you a quick little video since we have a few minutes and it's all on setting the table. And I want you to pay really close attention to how this table's being set. And then, cause I might ask you a few questions after it's done. So hopefully I'll show you a quick video. It's called In the Kitchen. Hello everyone. Today we are going to be showing you guys how to set the table. So if you do have one, please put a placemat down at each spot of the table in order for it to catch all the crumbs that you may drop. Next, we are going to take the plate we are going to be eating off of. This is our example, and you, and you need to put it in the middle of your placemat, or if you don't have a placemat, that's fine, just on your table. Next, we are going to take our fork and our napkin. We folded this so it would fit on our placemat and put it on the left side of our placemat and the fork on top of the napkin. Next, we are going to take our butter knife and put it on the right side of our placemat and have it closest to the plate. Next, we're just gonna take our spoon and put it the farthest away from the plate. Next, if you're having bread or salad, please put your bread, plate, or salad bowl right above your fork on the left side of your spot. Next, we are going to take our ice water or whatever beverage you may have during your dinner and you're gonna put it right above your knife and your spoon. Hope you enjoyed, this is how you set the table. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Yes. So if we were setting our table and you looked at the video, what side of the plate does the fork go on? The right side. The left side. Is that what we said? <coughs> yep. And it goes on top of the what? Napkin. The napkin. napkin. And then we have the plate. And then what was the next thing on the first one on the right hand side? The knife. The knife. And then the spoon, right? Black. White. On the right hand side. I'm going to pull this up real quick and see if you can see this and still hear me. Okay, can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. So we got the fork and the napkin. We got the plate, the knife, and we got the spoon. And I'm gonna tell you something really quick as a tip to always remember what side the fork goes on. You're gonna put the fork on first and who knows how to spell fork? How do you spell fork? What does fork start with? What does it start with? Start with an F. So if you kind of look at this and you say fork, F, and then you got an O, and then you got, I don't know where the R is, just make believe it's there. And then you got K for the knife and S, so forks. So if you're setting the table, you always want it to kind of spell forks. And then above the fork goes your salad or roll, and above your knife and spoon goes your beverage. Okay, so when you help set the table, always make sure you got your forks and knives where they're supposed to be. That's really important. How's our timer going? Who's keeping track? I still got six minutes. Anybody peek in their pot and see how the dumplings are going? They're looking pretty good. If we were eating this meal tonight for supper, which some of you might be and keep saying, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. I'm not sharing my screen still, am I? 
Nope. Okay. No. Yeah. All right. Um, what else would we, could we eat with this meal? So we're having chicken and dumplings. That's our main course. And I'd probably not want it on a plate. I'd want it in a bowl. And I put a big bowl in the middle of my, where my plate was in that diagram. But what else could you eat with this? We're having a brownie for dessert with all. Oh, that sounds good. Definitely a brownie for dessert. Desserts are always good. We don't really need bread because it's in there, right? Yeah, maybe some fruit. Do we have any fruit in this recipe? Mashed we potatoes. Fruit. We got vegetables in there, right? Mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes, somebody said. Mm -hmm. We could, but we're going to be healthy and add some fruit. We'll see. And in a sense, it's a meal in itself. It has our protein, it has our starch, it has our veggies. The only thing that's kind of missing if we're talking about my plate is our fruit. And it has a little dairy in it because we put milk in our dumplings, but you might want to have a glass of milk. I'm going to pull a dumpling out and see how mine are doing. If I can. Ooh, no, I said I got some big ones. I got some big ones in there. I must have really got lazy. That's what my dumpling looks like right now. And if I took a knife and kind of cut it in half, now make know that they're going to be moist. They're not going to be done like a biscuit would totally be done because they're cooking in water. But what you want to make sure is that it's not doughy in the middle. So they're almost done. And I don't know if you can see that very well. Maybe if I set it up. See how it's kind of cakey down there? You want them to be cakey. And it, my recipe says it really has about four more minutes, but mine are kind of floating. And I think they'd be pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead, if yours are about the consistency of mine, we're gonna add the kale. And pretty much what you're doing is just fluffing that kale in there. It's all gonna go on the top to begin with. And then you're just gonna push it down in. And that'll separate your dumpling some. And kale or any kind of greens is gonna cook super quick. So they don't need a whole lot of time and while you're pushing it in, if your dumplings ended up big like mine, you can chop a few in half even and let that kale sit in there. And you're just letting it simmer. It says about five minutes. That's why you add the kale very last to your recipe because it cooks super quick. And I know you're gonna say, oh, I don't want the green in it. I might not like it as well. I can tell you two little kids that are watching this video, maybe unless they already gave up. Jessa and Davis, they might already gave up. You never know. But anyways, they love spinach in anything. They'll put spinach in their eggs. So don't turn your nose up to the kale till you try it. All right, any questions? That's pretty much a recipe for tonight. We were close to having you ready to eat by seven o'clock. Not quite. Next week's recipe, chicken Alfredo, right, Shelly? Yes, and I am super excited about that recipe because I love Alfredo and it's got one of my favorite vegetables in it with the broccoli. Yep. And honestly, for this one, I don't think you have to do any prep work ahead of time. And it probably will cook a little quicker than our chicken and dumplings. This recipe probably was going to be the one that was taking the longest for all of us to be ready to eat. Yes. Any questions? Can I have it? I have a couple questions. This is Bethany talking. Okay. My, I tried to get here from work, but I wasn't fast enough. So I did miss the beginning and I, we've been playing catch up. We're doing okay. Um, but regular dumplings is something 
we've made for years. But my kids love the dumplings that are in the chicken and dumplings at the Wolf Festival. So that's why I keep asking you about the flat, the rolled out ones. Right. They're making them more like a noodle. They're making them more like a thicker noodle. So and if you would add more flour to that. I would not. Yeah. You do. do, Bethany, did you take the um, hot cross buns class? Yep. Remember how that was a softer dough? Yes. A softer dough. So you're going to want to not do a ton of flour, but sprinkle a little flour. You can pat yeah. out thinner with your hands, even if you want to roll it so it doesn't stick to the knife pin, but make sure your hands are wet. And yeah. then you're going to take your knife and slice them into the flatter noodle-like shapes. Okay, and then go from there, the rest, like the rest of the recipe. I yep. can't wait to check this out with the kale. We make a kale soup, but I've never had kale in chicken and dumpling soup. No, <laughs> me <laughs> either, to be quite honest. That yes. should be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Now, keep remember, this is extension, and this is an extension public, published cookbook. So not only are we trying to make traditional things, we're also trying to add a twist to make them a little healthier and getting yeah. things. We're very excited. We're there very you excited. go. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks. Everybody's dumplings look pretty good. Oh, that was my timer for my dumplings to be done. I got some good looking chicken and dumplings. What about you guys? Everybody's quiet. You can unmute yourself and talk now if you want. Well, I need my pop holder back down. I might burn my placemat. Smells great. Now remember two things. Shelly and I like to see pictures. I can tip it too far, but that's what mine looks like in the pot. Okay. Oh, watch out. I wanted to see pictures of your chicken and dumplings. I want to see pictures of you eating the kale. And I want to see pictures of how you set the table if you help set the table. And you can just post those on our Facebook page. Um, so, if I bowl it up, don't they look pretty in a bowl? Oh, they do. It's like my supper. What does your supper look like? And I say they do. Mom, they do. Okay. I'm going to stop recording because I